that was very uh, evident tonight as I watched you come together and worship. And it's, and it's really been an honor to be here with you and worship with you. I have a lot of ground to cover tonight. Uh, do I have, what's my, what's my point? Um, so I'll just, I'll just say this, that um, again, like I mentioned earlier, if you, if you need to leave, we totally understand that. Um, and we would just ask that as you make your way out the door, uh, just to try to do it as quiet, quietly as possible. And we'll try to give you just as much time, you know I mean? Uh, as far as, we're going to be here well into the early morning anyway. So uh, okay. we just want to hear what you got to say. Okay. okay. All right. So good. Okay. And I'll try to go fast because nobody likes um, somebody who's really windy and not really saying anything. Okay. So the question is tonight that I have, and, and actually I should change the name of my presentation. I should change the name from talking about how to begin the new year to talking about the preeminence of Yeshua. Because when we start to look at the calendar and we start to look at the Bible at large, everything should point to Yeshua. Okay? So when we begin to look at the calendar tonight, I want you to see... I'm going to begin to bring out that Yeshua is preeminent in everything we have been given to understand the calendar. Josephus's writings, when he writes about history, he's using the Roman calendar at large. So running with two calendars is really nothing new. But our calendar that we got, we have today was written by Pope Gregory. So our calendar that we have today is, uh, and used in Israel, the civil calendar, was not the calendar that Elohim intended for us to use. So we have a question. Where does the Jewish calendar come from? <laughs> the current calendar that's used by Judaism and the nation of Israel is based in part by scripture and in part by tradition. If you speak to a religious man at the Western Wall today and, and, and you ask him, what makes you Jewish? What sets you apart from the rest of the world? He won't say Torah, he'll say our traditions. Without our traditions, we're nothing. So the calendar that they use, again, is part scriptural and part tradition. Um, So the purpose of the biblical calendar is about correct worship between Jehovah and man. It's a very ancient path that should lead us from the fall of Adam to the restoring work of the second Adam, the coming of the second Adam. If we can't find Mashiach in all parts of the calendar and in all parts of the scripture, then we have something that's not true to course. Uh, Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15, 45, it says, So it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quick new spirit. How many of you have heard of the divine order that the Bible was written in? You understand that the days of creation were in divine, intelligent order? that uh, Elohim gave to us to understand. Are any of you familiar with this, like, this concept? Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's a divine order that starts in Genesis. And this divine order is to give understanding to us. Elohim uses many things. He uses patterns. He uses cycles. 
he uses word pictures. And one of the biggest things he uses is this pattern that he's given us to understand. So for example, let's look at one that we probably all know, and that is what did Yeshua say? He said that man was not made for the Sabbath, the Sabbath was made for man, right? Okay, so basically the principle of this divine order is whatever precedes is served by whatever follows. Mm. Man preceded the Sabbath, and the Sabbath serves, serves man as a time to come away, sorry, as a time to come away to a sacred place from the world and be with the Creator. So if we look at this, the sixth day man was created, the seventh day is the Sabbath. Man was made in the sixth day, man precedes the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. So this is the divine order we're beginning to see. In Genesis 1-3, God said, And let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, and it was good. And God divided the light from darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. John 1.1 1, 1 says basically the same thing. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God. And all things were made by Him, and without Him He was not, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And John 1.8, He, John, was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of the light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. And He, Yeshua, was in the world, and the world was made by Him, and the world knew him not. Again, we're looking at the calendar and establishing the calendar through the preeminence of Yeshua. Okay? We're being told right here that everything that came to be came to be by, through, and for Yeshua. Colossians 1.15, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things consist. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. All things, all things, for the visible, invisible, it doesn't matter. In all things he had preeminence. And when we have not tapped into this, divine order that we've been given, we miss a whole bunch of stuff. And it finishes, for it pleased the Father that in him should dwell, should all fullness dwell. Okay. So who is the image? Yeshua is the image, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him we looked at this through him, all things were created. Isaiah 9, 6, for unto us is a child, child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, his name shall be Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Are you understanding that this is placing Yeshua at the beginning of Genesis? Yes. Okay. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So, Basically, what we've just seen is Yeshua is the light of day one. Everything was made, uh, everything was made, was made by him. It was made through him, through that light of the first day. Uh, it was made for that light. Because when we look at creation, on the first day, all of you separated the light from darkness. And we're told that Yeshua is the light in men. Okay? So everything that came to pass happened after that first day of light. Okay? So that's a divine order, and these orders are very important. Ephesians 2, 7, that in ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Jesus Christ. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works that which God hath beforehand ordained that we should walk in them. Okay, please accept these two statements from me because this is going to be very important. Statement number one, the story of Adam Eve and Eve is a true anecdotal telling of events. Beyond any shadow of doubt, I want you to understand, I believe that it actually truly really happened. 
I also believe that the story of Adam and Eve are a spiritual allegory, okay? So, when I talk about the fall of Adam, I'm not picking on the men because it's an allegory. I don't have time to get into that allegory tonight, but it's a beautiful allegory. Um, and when I talk about, about, when I talk about Adam, he was a type of a priest in the garden. When I talk about Eve, she was a type of the bride in the garden. So there's an allegory there that is more than just a male and a female, a husband and a wife. Okay? Before Adam fell into sin, they ate from the trees in the garden. After the fall, the earth was cursed. It says in Genesis 2.16 that the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest eat freely. In Genesis 3.17, unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. And that word ground is Adama. Okay? And sorrow you shall eat of it all the days of your life. So we have a stream of words here that are all significant to Genesis, especially Genesis. When we look at the story of the fall, even to Cain and Abel, we have Dom, which is blood, Adam, which is creation, and Aduma, which is the earth. Okay? It was the Dom of Cain, I'm oh, sorry, of um, Abel, thank you. Brain's a little fatigued. It was the, it was the blood of the Dom of Abel that called from the earth, okay? From the cursed earth. So the pattern of Adama, which is really important, is do you know in the scripture that there are seven first fruits offerings? Do you know in the scripture that there are seven first fruits offerings? Are you aware of that? Are you aware that the calendar of Elohim is based in seven first fruits offering? A lot of people will know about the barley, Possibly they knew about the wheat. But there were five more past that. And so when we look at the word Adoma, we find that the first fruits offering were divided into two categories. The two categories are the fruit from the soil, the fruit from the Adoma, and the fruit from the trees. Deuteronomy 8a lists the seven species. It's the land of wheat, barley, vine, figs, pomegranates, a land of oil, olive, and honey. And I divided them, color-coded them by words, so that you can see that the wheat and barley are the fruit of the soil, of the Adama. And then you have five fruits from the trees. Deuteronomy 28, 42, all thy trees and the fruit of thy Adama shall the locusts consume. This was a, quote, a curse, but it's listing all of the seven species by dividing them into those two categories, the fruit of the earth and the fruit of the trees. Nehemiah 10, 35, to bring the first fruits of our ground, Adama, and the first fruits of, the, of all the trees year by year into the house of the Lord. So there were seven first fruits offering that were due on an annual basis. And by the way, I think April said this, but it's important for you to know, um, I have only been called to be a land witness um, and what does that mean? A land witness means I say what I see. Okay, so scripture says that heaven and earth bear witness whether we're cursed or blessed. And part of that bearing witness was whether or not they had first fruits to offer in the temple. Okay, because if they didn't have first fruits, they couldn't appear before him. What does the scripture say? Three times a year shall your males before, appear before me, and none shall appear before me empty. So if heaven and earth were witnessing against them, they couldn't appear in the temple. So when Adam fell, okay, wait, let me back up. At the fall, Adam uh, must immediately begin to grow bread. Genesis 3.19. In the sweat of thy fat face thou shalt eat bread until thou art returned into the ground. For out of it thou wast taken, for dust thou art, and until dust thou shalt return. When Adam fell, the law was given. How can I prove it? Because Adam was commanded to grow bread from the Adama. Bread from the Adama is barley and wheat. It is the grains of the seven first fruits offering. 
Whereas by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed when there was no law. So when Adam fell, Elohim had to impute sin to him, and he did it by the law. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been guilty. Otherwise, there was no standard to witness against him. So the pattern of the first month in the story of Adam and Eve is we see that in Genesis 3, 7, that they clothed themselves in thick leaves. And the eyes of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed thick leaves together and made themselves apron. Matthew 24, 32. Now learn the parable of the fig tree. When its branch is yet tender and putteth forth fruit, you know that summer, kites, the Hebrew word for summer is kites. The meaning behind the summer is harvest. You know that kites, harvest, is near. Yeshua was speaking about himself because the, when, when he said this verse, he was just a few days ahead of laying his life down. And I have witnessed every year, just as the biblical calendar is ready to begin, the fig leaf will begin to put its leaves on. Okay? Remember, I'm just a witness. But this is my witness to you. This is what I have seen. And then they were clothed in animal skins. Genesis 3.21. Until Adam, all, and to Adam also and his wife did God make coats of skin and clothed them. And Exodus 3.12.3. 3, Speaking to the congregation of Israel, saying, The tenth day of this month they shall take... Uh, then every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for the house. And if the house be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbors next to his house take it according to the number of their souls. Every man, according to his eating, shall make your count of the lamb. John 1, 29. And the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Revelation 1, 13, 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, worship him whose name was not written in the Lamb's book of life, slain forever from the foundation of the earth. The Lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. Twenty-five times he was called the Lamb in the book of Revelation. So we're seeing preeminent patterns of Yeshua in Genesis. The, heart, the, um, the harvest of first fruits of barley and lambs are needed for Passover and the week of unleavened in the first biblical month. In the Jewish calendar, some of the rabbis believed that the world was created in the seventh month, and the calendar was later changed to begin on the first month, or Nisan. Uh, other rabbis believe that the seventh month cycle represents the beginning of a new agricultural cycle. By the period of the Mishnah at the beginning of the second century, the seventh month had become the beginning of the year due, due to sabbatical cycles and jubilees. Although the function of this new year relate primarily to the agricultural cycle, and the beginning of a new harvest year, the Mishnah also begins to assign it conceptually and theological meanings. Remember I told you, some of the things that they do are based in scripture. Some of the things they do are based in tradition. Okay? The beginning first fruit of the biblical agricultural season is barley. Ancient barley has roughly a 90 to a possible 108 105 day life cycle. If the rains were to begin in the eighth month, which they're saying the seventh month is the turn of the biblical year, okay, of, of the agricultural year, they're saying they're saying they chose the seventh month to indicate it's a new agricultural cycle. In order to begin a new agricultural cycle, we've got to have rain. How many of you know in Israel we get rain for four months out of the year and that's it? That is it. Whatever grows after those four months of rain happens because of those four months of rain. End of story. Okay, so when we look at the seventh month as the beginning of an agricultural cycle, then my mind would tell me that we would begin to see new growth. 
But because barley has 190 to 100 and basically five more or less day cycle of life before it drops to the earth, and I'm talking about the wild barley, if the rains started in the seventh month, our year would only have 10 months. Okay? So a lot of these things, I believe, happened when they were not in the land and they had had, like us, they had become disconnected from understanding. But it was in 200 CE when the seventh month became Rosh Hashanah. So the Jews actually have four New Years. They are uh, the first of Tishri, the first of Nisan, the first of Elul, and uh, two two Bish Shabbat. Uh, and each one of them represents a different aspect of their agriculture. So you have, depending on the rabbi, uh, he can believe that the first month, or Nisan, is uh, the agricultural beginning of the year, and the seventh month is the civil beginning of the year. So there's a lot of division, even among the rabbis, the way they see these four new years. So really, basically, the question that, that we need to start looking at is who are we going to follow? Are we going to follow the Lamb? Amen. Okay. Wow. Or, yeah, basically that's it. Are we going to follow the Lamb? Revelation 14, 4. These are they that were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb, wheresoever he goeth. They are redeemed from among men, being first fruits unto God and the Lamb. You've just been given a major clue. First fruits represents humanity. Okay? Yes, Yeshua fulfilled, yes, Yeshua fulfilled part of that for sure. But uh, James, I think it is, says we are a type of his first fruits. So understanding the biblical cycles according to the seven species gives understanding to the timing that was and the timing that will be. Because, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, so I'm going to try to go a little bit faster. Mm -hmm. am, I, am I doing an okay pace? I mean, I don't want to be dragging. I'm okay on my pace? Okay. Yeah. Deuteronomy 28, this, this is the curses and the blessings uh, that we read about in the scripture. This is how we knew whether or not we were pleasing to Elohim. Uh, if we did not have anything to offer, we knew we were not praising, we were not uh, pleasing to him. So the reminder of what happened with Adam was embedded in the food they ate. Foolishly, Adam missed the point that his provision for even his very breath came from Elohim. And the Lord God formed man from the dust of the earth and breathed, puffed, inflated, kindled into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And then he says in Genesis 3, 19, In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread, till thou be turned to the ground, for out of it thou was taken, for dust thou art, unto dust thou shalt return. Immediately the scripture provides the next scene in which Eve gives birth to a firstborn son. Okay, so you got firstborn, you've got, you've got the curse on the ground, you've got Adam bringing forth bread from the earth, and now you've got Eve bringing forth the firstborn sons. Okay, it says um, the following scene, the following scene is Abel offering the first and best from his flocks, but Cain completing his grain harvest and offering something that didn't represent a first fruits. And that's why Elohim was upset with him. That's why his face was told, turned towards Abel, and his face was turned from Cain, because Abel offered the first and best, and Cain just offered. Okay, So you're seeing, what do we got in the first month? The lamb on the 10th, and a first fruits offering out of the field. So again, we've just witnessed the beginning of the book of calendar with an example of what not to do. The first, the beginning of the first fruits of thy land, thou shalt bring into the house of the Lord. Thou shalt not see the kid in his mother's milk. 
in the book of Exodus, Elohim reintroduces the Israelites to his calendar, and he says, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. This day you came out in the month of B. And actually, in Hebrew, it says, this day you come out in the month of the Abib. Abib was never the name of a month. Abib was the name of something in that month. Okay? And in English, it says, this month, or Chodesh, shall be the beginning, the Reshit, of months, Chashim. It shall be the first, the Rishon, Kodesh, of your Shana. So basically, this is the scripture that tells us when the head of the new year is in Exodus 12, 2. It's in the month of the Abib. Does anybody know what the Abib is? It's green and tender ears it's, of barley. That's right. That's right. So scripture tells us, okay, this shall be the beginning of your months. It says, in the day that you exited, that little H thread, in the, or sorry, I, I, I do that all the time. It's not an H, it's a hey. Okay. It's, a, it's a H, that's how I write Hebrew. <laughs> in, in the day that you exited, in the, in the month of the Abi, okay? So that's what it says in Hebrew, ha -abi. And I say Abi, Abi, I, I, I'm all over the place with that because I read King James and it always says Abi, so I don't have a, place I land. I go back and forth. Observe the month of the Abib and keep the Passover unto the Lord thy God. For in the month of the Abib, the Lord thy God brought thee forth out of Egypt by night. Deuteronomy 16.1. Okay, so I need to open this up because I squished a lot of scripture on this page to save space. And... So we'll, we'll, we'll fly by the seat of our pants. Okay, so what we're looking at here is we're looking at the progression of what we're told about how to begin the year. We're told that there is a month with something called a bee in it, a bee, and we're told in Exodus 9, 31 and 32 what the condition of some items were that would explain to us what a bee is. Exodus 9, 31 and 32 talks about the flax and the barley. This is the plagues in Egypt. They were smitten by hail and fire. Okay. So it says the flax and the barley were smitten, for the barley was in the ear, and behind that in the ear word is the Hebrew word of eat. And the flax was bold, and that means it's full in bloom. Um, and then later on, it also talks about that the, the wheat was uh, not grown up. And Leviticus 2.14, it says, If thou wilt offer a meat offering of first fruits unto the Lord, thou shalt offer the meat offering of thy first fruits, green ears of corn, a bee, dried by fire, even ears beaten, even corn beaten out of full ears. So what we're doing here is we're linking this a bee to a time of the year. And we're linking this Aviv to being the first fruits of the year that were offered in the temple. At Leviticus 2.1, And when any woman shall offer a meat offering unto the Lord, his offering shall be a fine flour, and he shall pour oil upon it and put frankincense thereon. So all of these scriptures, when they're gathered together, points to a product called barley that has to be in the agricultural condition of the year. And it has to be able to make a flower, okay, to be offered. If it doesn't make a flower, if it can't pass through the fire, and if it doesn't make a flower, then it's not a bee. It's too immature. Okay. Many people that are 
trying to understand the calendar apart from this order of creation that I've been speaking with you about. The very next thing they go to after they understand that the barley is a, a bee and is their first fruits offering is they go back to Genesis 1.14. And they want to look at that, 1.14 through 19, and they want to look at that and say, well, you know, we have to have an equinox because this scripture says that the sun, moon, and the stars are for times and seasons, which are more deep, and signs. And so they, they read into that, that we need this process of having an equinox or an equal lux before we can begin the year. But is that true, okay? If we look at the order of creation, is that true? On day three, what was made? How many know the order of Genesis? What was made on the third day? Plants. That's right. And what was made on the fourth day? Okay. So what precedes is served by what comes after. The order of creation tells us that we don't need the stars to bring the barley. Or the sun. Have you ever seen white asparagus? Mm -hmm. It's grown completely without the sun. And there are people who will fight you and tell you that we have to have the equinox because it has to warm the earth and it has to do this. And But that's not what scripture says. That avocado seed right there, where did it grow first from? The root. Okay? It set down the root first. It didn't send up the stalk first. First the roots anchor themselves. I don't know how well you can see that, but that is actually a barley, a wild barley grain. And at the very top of the head of that grain, you'll see two white protrusions. And that is the barley grain anchoring itself to the earth after the rains have started. Now let's look what Yeshua said. And he said, so is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed into the ground, and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up, and he knoweth not how. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself. Yeshua agrees with the order of creation. First the blade, then the ear, after the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately, immediately he put it in the sickle because the harvest has come. Actually, Genesis 1.11 says the same thing. It says that God said, let the earth bring forth grass. But we're told from Genesis that it's the earth that's going to bring forth grass, which are the grains. Let the earth bring forth grass, the herbs yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it is so. The grass, the seeds, oh sorry, the seed of grasses were placed in the earth. They grew when man fell. The rains came to the earth. Uh, further, we are plainly told here in creation, in the creation story, that the earth brings forth grass. The Genesis story agrees with Yeshua. The earth brings forth grass fruit from itself. Sunlight beyond a shadow of a doubt helps the plant to produce chlorophyll. In natural seeds, when natural seeds fall to the earth and begin to sprout, they sprout in darkness. Only after the plant exits the ground and stands above the earth does the light from the sun add to the benefit of the plant. Mm -hmm. The earth grows seeds from the soil from itself. Yes. This is such a hard concept for people these days. Why? How many people grow their food? Some. Not as many, Not many as should, because the less agriculture we have in our life, the harder that the Word of God is to understand. Amen. From Genesis to Revelation, it's an agricultural language. Mm -hmm. And if we don't understand the agriculture, then we have a huge hole in our understanding. 
Um, let's see. The earth brings forth seed from its from, from its soil, for the earth brings forth fruit of herself. Mark two twenty eight. In Yeshua's preeminent position, he is the seed that was predestined on the day that heaven and earth were created. And I didn't see that. I did not see that verse. So, April, would you do me a huge favor and pull up Genesis 2, I think 4 and 5, where it talks about the seed was in the earth and the day that El Elohim created the heavens and the earth? To what? I think it's 2, 4, and 5. So it's like these sorts of not working, you know that. These are the records of the heavens and the earth concerning their creation? Is that it? Yeah. These are the records of heavens and the earth concerning their creation. At the time the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, no shrub of the field had, had yet grown on the land, and no plant of the field had yet sprouted. For the Lord God had not made it rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. That's right. But the myths came up from the earth and the water on the ground. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we're told in Genesis 2, in the generations of heaven and earth, that the seed was in the earth. And it was not yet activated because it had not yet rained, and man was not yet. So why why is that important? What does Deuteronomy 32, the Song of Moses, say? The Song of Moses likens rain to the doctrine of Elohim. Okay, so when Adam sinned and God went through His presence, He had to show. Adam's favor by sending rain to grow the seeds. Mm. Amen. Okay, Yeshua was the, the back, we're back to the preeminence again. I, I took you on a little roundabout to get back to Yeshua again. Yeshua was the promised seed of, Ab, of Eve, the promised seed of Abraham, and the promised seed to humanity. Throughout scriptures, seeds and grass represent people. And I'm going to give you just a couple of verses to help you understand that. There's all kinds of verses. This is just a couple. Then I will pluck them up by the roots out of my Adoma, which I have given them, and this house, which I have sanctified for my name. I will cast out cast them out of my sight and will do and will make it to be a proverb and a byword among the nations. Uh, Psalms 102, 11. My days are like a shadow that declineth. I am withered like a grass. Psalms 103, 15. For as a man, his days are as the grass, as the flower of the field, so he flourisheth. Okay? That seed that would give bread to Adam was in the earth the day that heaven and earth were created. That seed represents Yeshua, the bread of life. Amen. The promise was fulfilled at the resurrection. That promise to Mary. What was the promise to Mary? That her seed would have a battle, right? That he would bruise the head of the serpent. And the seed of Mary, his heel would be bruised. Eve. I'm sorry. Thank you. Eve. Eve. Yeah. Forget my very fatigued brain. Um, and so we see that when Yeshua raised from the dead, okay, he was, uh, he was, in his human body, he was as barley. He was, that's why we have unleavened barley cakes on the Passover table. And in his human form, he was the sinless son of man. That's represented in the unleavened barley, okay? But on his father's side, he was wheat. Because Yeshua said, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the earth and dies, he abides alone. But if he falls to the earth and dies, he brings forth many. So wheat represents the word of God in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Okay. So when Yeshua resurrected, what happened? The earth shook. He was raised from his death seat, sleep, sleep, okay? The seed of the eternal one came out of the earth and was reborn in his incorruptible image. Who was at the tomb when Yeshua conquered death? and bruised the head of the serpent. It was the women. It was the symbol of Eve. Mm. 
And the end of the Sabbath is the beginning to dawn, of course, the first day came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, and the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and set upon it. And his countenance was like lightning in his ring that was white as snow, and for fear of him the keepers did shake and become as dead men. And the angel asked and said unto the woman, answered and said unto the woman, Fear not ye, for I know that you seek Jesus, which is crucified. I'm going to throw a little bit of a bonus in here because I can't help myself. <laughs> Yeshua came to undo everything that was done. What happened when, when Elohim put Adam to sleep? He took Eve from his side, right? When the second Adam laid his life down and he was on the stake, in his death sleep, because the scripture likens death unto a sleep. The soldier pierced his side, and the blood and the water flowed. What was happening? He was giving birth to his bride, just the way the first Adam had given birth to his bride, Eve. Yes. Okay. So all of these shadows and these types and these patterns Offers a richness that we have forgotten how to tap into. And again, this is about the preeminence of Yeshua. Colossians says he's before all things, and all things consist by him. Okay, so yes. What about the Moedim that's in Genesis 1.14? Because Genesis 1.14 obviously says that there was a Moedim connected to the sun and the stars. Pop quiz. Why is the Moedim in Genesis? There was a Moedim in Genesis. Do you know what it was? Shabbat. Shabbat. When we go to um, Leviticus 23... It says, six days shall work be done, but the seventh is the Sabbath rest. Just above that, he says, speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, concerning the Moedim of the Lord, you shall proclaim the holy convocations, even my Moedim. And then the very first one he lists is the very first one he gave in Genesis. The order of importance. His order is fine order that he's created. So Genesis 1, 14 and 19 is a valid scripture because before the fall, he created the Shabbat. He created man, and he rested on the seventh day, Shabbat. Then Adam fell. Then the law was added. This month shall be unto you, the beginning of months, it shall be the first month of the year unto you. Speak unto the congregation of Israel, saying, and the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. Lambs were needed for Passover. There had to be lambs to furnish every man in the tribes of Israel with a portion of lamb to eat. In addition, the scripture says the lambs must be eight days old. Okay? So in Israel... My neighbor, Asher, is a Jewish shepherd, and uh, he does things the old-fashioned way. He doesn't give the lambs hormone, because he's a shepherd by himself. He has no one to help him. He's not like most of the, well, predominantly uh, Bedouin or, or uh, Arab shepherds with large families. They'll give their sheep a hormone, and all of them will give birth just within days of each other. But Asher doesn't do that because he's by himself. And so it's much easier for him to let this happen naturally. The lambs are usually born circa the 11th month. Circa. For the coming year that would make the Passover lamb. So we need lambs and we need barley to begin the first month of the year.
Okay, so there's also this little thing that there's a lot of people that get hung up on. It's called the Zadok scale, and the Zadok scale was created to determine modern barley buy, which the ancient brains do not act anything like the modern barley. And a lot of people like to use this scale because they like the term Zadok, but it really doesn't have anything to do with what you need to know about barley. Really what it boils down to is when people start using modern terms like this, you have to learn a new, new buzzwords. If you walk up to the calendar and you want to learn about barley and someone starts talking, you well, that's a 6.5 on the Zadok scale. Well, what does that mean to you? Nothing, nothing. And it wasn't created to be that way, okay? So that's, that's one of the things that we look at is it's a very modern method that has no bearing on scripture. Okay. Going back to Exodus 9, 31 and 32. The first use, are you familiar, you guys, with the first use of a, of a Hebrew word that a lot of times, the first place a Hebrew word is used, it will actually describe itself. It will actually define itself. Okay? So when we go back to the first use of the word be, we see that it's the key to understanding what a bee is. The flax and the barley were smitten, for the barley was in the ear, or a bee. The flax was bold, or in bloom, but the wheat and the rye were not smitten, because they were not grown up. In the Galilee, in the first century, circa the time of Yeshua, um, that area between Mount Arbel and um, what is that? Migdal, was the largest producer of linen to flax in the Middle East. So the scriptures that worked in Exodus work in Israel. When the barley is a bee, when it's in that condition, the flax will be in bloom in the land of Israel. And the wheat will not be grown up. It'll be down, the head will be down, into, down in the plant, but the head won't be revealed yet. Okay, you can tell it's it looks pregnant. You can tell the head's down in there, but it's not showing yet. <clears throat> okay, we talked about Yeshua as the kernel of wheat that fell to the earth. This is a, a little bit difficult to explain, but I'm going to try to explain it to you. John 12, 24 says, Verily I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. Okay. We know that Yeshua was the second Adam, the sinless son of man. We know that Yeshua was the son of God. Right? Okay. So in order to be both, when Yeshua was on the cross, the wheat seed of the word of God was in him. But the scripture talks about him not being glorified yet. So in other words, he wasn't raised. When the barley is a bee, when the barley is a bee, I'm getting off my nose, but it doesn't matter. When the barley is a bee, the wheat will be just before being born. It'll be just before showing its head. Because, because why? In the resurrection, he was resurrected as the son of God which is wheat. So we need the barley to be a bee. And within the week of unleavened bread, we need the wheat to come out of the plant and start showing its head. And if it does that on Shavuot, the wheat will be ready to harvest. So when we talk about the timing of the first fruits offering, it's extremely succinct, and there's no room for error. And if I have determined by witnessing the land and, and trying to understand what Elohim is saying from the earth, if I've determined the barley and the wheat correctly, then the grapes will be ready in the fifth month, the figs will be ready in the sixth month, the pomegranates, the dates, and the olives will be ready in the seventh month. Yeah. But what we need to know going back to the seed Yeshua, that from the beginning, the battle has always been over the seed. The battle 
has been for the seed. Okay. And again, the head of the year looks like the lambs are born. They've achieved at least seven days with the mother. The earliest owner of wild barley in all of Israel can be roasted and make flour. The flax is in bloom and the wheat is pregnant. The heads will come out of the plant in the week of unleavened bread. Okay, so this is a divine orchestration that nobody can cause but Elohim. Okay. We'll skip ahead of some of this because I know it's getting long for you. Okay, so we're going to again look at some of the traditions. The rabbinical calendar or the Jewish calendar or the national calendar of Israel is no longer predominantly based in agriculture. And Josephus tells us something. He says, that in the month of, if you want to try to pronounce that, be my guest, it's Roman, uh, which is called by us Nisan, is the beginning of our year on the 14th day of the lunar month, when the sun rises in Aries. Do you read anything about agriculture in that statement? And why did they do it? For in the month, for in this month, it was that we were delivered from bondage under Egypt. So they were keeping their beginning of the calendar and the month of Aries because they wanted to stay in, in, in um, harmony with the time that Israel walked out of Egypt. Forget that the scripture says not to delay to offer the beginning of your first fruits. Okay? They were keeping the calendar in the, in the constellation of Aries. And this is the rest of that. Um, we don't have to look at all of that. That's, there's not a lot said, but a lot of what uh, is, is written about here is really not even about Passover. It's about the, the peace offerings and all of those offerings that they could only offer when they were in Jerusalem. Okay, these are the flaws in the modern Jewish calendar of feasts. The Jewish calendar that dates from the time of Hillel II is an official calendar of the state of Israel along with the Gregorian calendar. It's a lunar solar calendar based on computations rather than visual observations. Sighting of the, new, the young crescent moon were used in ancient times. So when Hillel knew that the Jews were going to be carried out of the land, he created a calculation to keep everybody in sync, in sync you know? And so he didn't use the crescent moon to do it. He used the dark of the moon. How many of you know that in the Jewish calendar you have a choice of two days on some of the, it's because how many dark days do you have? Two. Yeah. The Jewish calendar year begins with Rosh Hashanah, as they call it, or Tishri 1. This date was determined by four rules, which can postpone Tishri 1 by one or two days after the fictitious new moon. So hear that, hear that. They don't want a, what we call a double Shabbos. They don't want two, two Shabbat Sabbaths together. It's too hard for the people to bear. And if that happens, they'll slide it over to one side or to the other, to keep them from having that the burden of the double shabbos. Mm -hmm. There's a mathematical error in the calculation of the Hallel calendar. Currently, that calculation has put them about a month later than the barley. And the longer they continue to use the equation, the greater that gap will grow. The calculation is darkened, reckoned from the dark of the moon and, and no longer trying to predict to the new moon sliver. So should we keep the calendar for the sake of unity with the Jews? Because there's a, 10 minutes? Okay, so, so there's, um, should we keep the calendar for the sake of unity with the Jews? According to scripture, that we need to come to unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and to the perfect man and to the measure of the fullness of the stature. So let me go here. 
Okay, <clears throat> briefly I want to talk to you about the beauty of the night we're on, the absolute beauty of the night we're on. The first fruits offering for this night is pomegranates, okay? When we look at Song of Solomon, what is it we see? We look at Song of Solomon and he talks about pomegranates. He says, my beloved is an orchard of pomegranates. He said, behind her veil is a piece of pomegranate. And what is the beloved, the bride, doing? She's searching the street. Have you seen my beloved? Have you seen the fairest of all? Young woman, have you seen him? She's constantly searching him. Where else do we see pomegranates? We see them on the tops of the columns on either side of the door of the temple. We see them on the hem of the garment of the high priest. So this shout of the king, which Yom Teruah is, is the waking up of the bride. Teruah harkens back to Sinai and the sound of the shofar there. Okay, so if we look at the feast, if we look at the feast, we're just going to do the seven months. There's first month, second month. Roughly, this is uh, Shavuot, the fourth month, the fifth month, the sixth month, the seventh month. We have these months represent barley and wheat. Okay? Then we have this long season where nothing goes on. And by the way, the parable of the sower, the, the, you know, some of the seeds fall along the path, some of the seeds uh, spring up and die back quickly. Some of the seeds are choked out, right? Right here, when the wheat is ready, the thorns and thistles come into the field. Why is that important? When did Yeshua ascend? Just before Shavuot. Okay? So, we read in the New Testament of the faith that the apostles contended for. We read in the New Testament that they left Paul. They had a division and they fall, fell away. So the contending for the faith began as soon as Yeshua ascended. So now we're at the seventh month. And if we look at this as a timeline of the restoration of all things, we've had this long season right here where people have fallen away and knowledge has been lost. Then we get to the seventh month, and suddenly there's the sound of the teruah, the waking up of the bride, the call of the king. That pomegranate, where the beloved has a pomegranate behind her veil, that, that image of her brain being fixed on Messiah. Okay, so the Yom Teruah is, in my opinion, from what I have seen, Yom Teruah is specifically to our time. Because we have been as those that didn't know what Torah was. Many are being awakened at this time. Many are hearing the call of the bridegroom at this time. Many are consumed with the desire to understand and to know him. Okay. So for me, the beauty of Yom Teruah is that specifically it would be at a much later time in history that we know that this was the first century believers, right? What did he say? John the Baptist said, he'll gather the wheat in his garners and he'll burn up the chaff. Okay? We're talking to the first century. Okay? Then we have this big gap. Now we're at the seventh month. So we are those that are waking up to the truth of Torah. The seventh Yom, uh, Yom, Kip, Yom Teruah is uh, pomegranates. Yom Kippur is uh, dates. And uh, the eighth day are olives. So what's that look like? When we wake up, we have to have a passion for him. What do the dates represent? Where did Deborah judge Israel? Sitting underneath a date tree, a palm tree. Okay, so we have to be totally in love with him. We have to have our mind fixed on him. We have to have righteous judgment. Devorah was a righteous judge to judge Israel. She was a shadow type of the bride. 
And we have to have, and when we have these two, then the eighth day, which is Lord Shimon, which is uh, olive oil, oil is Shimon, they share the same root word. When we have those two, then we walk in his anointing. So this call for us to come back, that's what the end of the year feasts are about, is the call for us to come back. Okay, guys. Mm -hmm. wow. 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 Wow.